post budget analysis of the union budget 2021 2022 uh, uh, meeting etiquettes we request all the participants to for a cooperation for on the following Except the speaker, moderator, office bearers, we request everyone to mute the mic and switch off their webcams to improve the bandwidth. Please keep your mobiles in silent mode or vibration mode. This meeting, being a brief and preference, is being given to the question received in advance. However, you may still type your questions on the chat box with your organizational name to be recognized for deliberation in case of adequate time is available. You may still send your questions to our chamber for compilation to the concerned authorities. We have made several test runs for the best in class for technology, but there are some minor chances of technical interruption and you are requested to be patient. You are free for drink tea and have your snacks behind the camera, but not entix others. Uh, Rupa, next one. Uh, this is a brief agenda for today's uh, uh, meet, uh, meeting. Uh, we, uh, Mr. Parshuraman, our president, BCIC, will do the welcome address and followed by Mr. K. R. Shaker, senior vice president, BCIC, will address the participants. After which we request our chief guest, Mr. Kamal Bali, president and managing director of Volvo Group India. And the keynote address will be done by Mr. Lakshmi Narayan, K. R., chief endowment officer, Aziz Premji Foundation. Followed which we'll have a panel discussion, which will be moderated by Mr. K. Balas Subramanian, chairman of the Direct Tax Export Committee of BCIC and Vice President and Global Head Corporate Tax Repo Limited. And the panelists will be Mr. Kamal Bali himself, Mr. Lakshmi Narayan Kaya, Mr. Kaya Shekhar, and Dr. Rukmi Majundar. She is an uh, Associate Director and Economist from Deloitte India, and Mr. Baskar K, partner Deloitte. And then we'll have the summing up session by Mr. Tapti, who is the Coordinator for Direct Tax Export Committee of BCIC and partner Deloitte Haskins and Sales. May I now invite uh, our president, Mr. T. R. Parshama, to kindly do the uh, welcome address. Over to you, sir. Sir, you are in mute, sir. Uh, thanks, Prithvi. I'm sorry. A very good morning to all of you. I extend a very, very hearty welcome to one of the most short and uh, interesting session on the post-budget analysis by uh, Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce in collaboration with uh, British Industrial Association. And of course, uh, we have a big support from Deloitte and friends. So uh, we have uh, very interesting speakers today. Uh, Mr. Kamal Bali, our uh, friend and uh, the president and managing director of Volvo Group India, he is with us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kamal Bali, for your valuable time. Uh, then uh, we have Mr. Lakshmi Narayana, KR, Chief uh, Endowment Officer, Azim Premji Foundation. Thank you, sir. Then, of course, uh, Mr. Pranod Jain, CFO Flipkart. So thanks for uh, taking your time. Then uh, we have uh, Mr. Rumki, Dr. Rumki Majumdar, Associate Director and Economist, Deloitte India. We have Mr. Baskar, Partner, Deloitte, Rushe. So much to India. Of course, uh, Mr. Balasubramaniam, Chairman, Direct Taxes, Expert Committee of BCIC, and Vice President and Head of uh, the Tax Division of Vipro, Mr. Uh, Sunil uh, Dareshwa, Co Chairman, Direct Tax Expert Committee, BCIC, and Global Head of Infosys, and Mrs. Tapti Ghosh, Coordinator, Direct Taxes and Expert Committee of BCIC, and partner uh, Deloitte. So, uh, and of course, uh, Mr. Shekha, I think, who has been the anchor of this program, our senior vice president and partner, Deloitte. So, uh, thanks, Shekha, for organizing this uh, wonderful program. And uh, today is one of the most important sessions, I would say, in the Bangalore chambers, because uh, this uh, budget, uh, according to us, was one of the most sought uh, budget. And uh, especially in the difficult times after the COVID pandemic, because uh, it was not easy for the government to come out with a kind of a right budget. But I think a uh, lot of uh, positives are coming in this budget, I would say. And definitely in line with the industry expectations, largely. 
and of course uh, there are some kind of uh, areas for improvement so the union minister this time announced the package totaling to 27.1 lakh to deal with the covid-19 pandemic which was one of the topmost priority in terms of health sector under the atmanirbhar package while presenting the union budget in the lower house of the parliament so uh, the key highlights uh, if i have to say the focus has been on the nation wide vaccination totaling to 35000 crores which is definitely a very important thing but yesterday the expenditure secretary tv somanathan was mentioning that it could be much more depending on the actual uh, uh, you know conditions of how the whole process proceed and of course two vaccines have been approved the coaxin and the coshu so this is definitely uh, going to be a very important uh, activity to bring back the health recovery on cards then atmanirbhar uh, sastha bharat health program which is another uh, major initiative 64180 crores uh, which will uh, focus on uh, you know important diseases and chronic diseases facing the nation and also as a kind of a post covid recovery and the vehicle scrappage policy which is uh, definitely uh, very much uh, required to improve the green environment and also to you know boost the overall vehicle <coughs> sales in the nation because this 20 year scrappage policy for the commercial vehicles and 15 year for the personal vehicles has been in cars for a long time and we are one of the advanced nations that we have not been able to implement this but this has been a very bold move this will definitely improve the overall uh, eco climate of the nation and also propel the few, you know vehicle sales in the days to come and the road connectivity i think this has been uh, one of the major moves i think uh, 1 lakh crores uh, 1.05 crores of lakh crores for tamil nadu 65000 crores for kerala 25000 crores for assam i think this is a major initiative uh, because uh, this will boost infrastructure and uh, spending on infrastructure then it will also generate employment Uh, so this is another uh, major move so if i have to say uh, in macro the spending is happening on health uh, infrastructure and of course a uh, lot of atmanirbhar uh, package on sanitation and hygiene and connecting 100 cities on gas mission across the nation so and of course 15000 education institutions across the nation uh, will be developed so this is a very good thing because the focus has been on the health education infrastructure and of course agriculture agriculture also has got a huge uh, support again this time uh, to support the farmers and msme again uh, around 15000 crores has been given uh, for funding the msmes so uh, these are all major uh, initiatives taken by the honorable uh, finance minister while uh, money is coming uh, mainly from this disinvestment of public sector banks two banks have been uh, labeled and one insurance company and lic of course and uh, public sectors so this is a major thing but the challenge is whether it will get to materialized because 1.75 lakh crores has to come from this kitty and the whole thing is whether will this money come will it happen on time because today the fiscal deficit is uh, moving from moving up to 9.7 9.8 this year then consolidating to you know 4.5 levels by 2026 so the fiscal consolidation definitely is a good balancing act but uh, again one more risk if it comes let us say the second pandemic breaks out will this budget take care of are we really prepared for the risk and uh, again there is a kind of a disappointment for a common man like uh, definitely there was some kind of a positive hope in the middle class that some kind of money will be lying in their hands so it has not come in a direct form but indirectly uh, the covid the cess or uh, some kind of additional tax burden is not put on the common man so that's a kind of a blessing in this case i would say you know, therefore a uh, lot of interesting things again in terms of manufacturing a huge impetus is coming one side uh, we are also increasing the import duties on steel and important auto parts components which means uh, this will uh, promote localization and the make in india drive and at the same time uh, we are developing a lot of uh, plug and play parks across the national corridors uh, this will uh, foster uh, accelerated growth of manufacturing in india and especially logistics competitiveness will improve in leaps and bounds 
because of a huge connectivity improvements in railway corridor and the road corridor which is definitely the need of the hour to take to the next uh, map for creating the 25% gdp of manufacturing in india so this is a kind of uh, you know plus and minus but nevertheless uh, employment generation is going to be on the cards and uh, there will be a kind of a demand propulsion you know because uh, definitely uh, this will create more employment which means more money in the hands of the people and more spending will happen so i would say that a lot of uh, things coming out of this budget so yesterday it looked very very uh, you know uh, attractive budget but i think we need to analyze this budget in uh, pros and cons because uh, more and more details are coming for example you know some of the shops like uh, provident fund is getting taxable uh, employees contribution beyond 2.5 lakhs which is definitely a welcome move because definitely people earning that kind of a salary it doesn't make any sense but uh, the key point is uh, the middleman what is going to get and uh, whether how this economy is going to change and what are all the challenges taking this economy forward uh, <laughs> we have got expert speakers today i don't want to take much of your time in fact i am very happy to say i think uh, shaker and team they have prepared a very detailed uh, representation to the honorable finance minister last month we had a one to one with the finance minister and we have given a lot of these proposals and i am very happy that uh, many of such proposals like scrappage policy and uh, infrastructure and roads shaker will explain in detail has come true so therefore uh, i am uh, very happy today that this uh, meeting is taking place in a timely manner and i now uh, look forward to hearing from the experts i hope you'll have a wonderful uh, value adding session today thank you very much over to shaker thank you thank you Thanks a lot, uh, Parashram. Uh, good morning, friends. Um, let me welcome you all on behalf of Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce, and uh, by me, of course. My organ. I should also thank Deloitte for being an active supporter of Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce in all their pursuits. I do not know how many of you are aware uh, that uh, Deloitte is one of the few corporates who have contributed. Five lakhs for the BCSE Building Development Fund. That is a level of commitment that my organization has got for Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce, and I should thank my organization also in this August audience. Uh, coming to the budget uh, session, I was extremely pleased. Uh, despite there is a family wedding taking place in my family yesterday, and I was hearing amidst the marriage ceremony, I was hearing the budget speech of. Nirmala Sitaraman, I was went through all the details yesterday night. I was extremely pleased on multiple reasons for multiple reasons. Of course, I'm disappointed with a couple of things, but disappointment I'll come later uh, because uh, you you can't please everybody in life. That is what I realized yesterday night. But as long as being an accountant, if I apply a Fin 48 test, 50 percentage, 75 percentage, and 90 percentage threshold, if I put it as an accountant. Uh, more than 90 percentage, I'm extremely pleased for multiple reasons, but let me just outline the reasons. First reason, it's uh, more of a reason to celebrate and also to reflect and also to see how to take it forward. It is a reflection of the commitment of the Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce team, particularly Parasuram, me and Ravindra, and of course, uh, I can't forget my past president, Devesh Agarwal, and this has a team, how we collectively collaborated with each other and gave a perspective to the government. A lot of our recommendations of BCAC and a lot of our thoughts have been accepted. Everybody, every chamber, every organization gives, but what I would like to take a sense of pride is that some of the statistics are finding place in this budget document. In that perspective, I'm very happy that some of the recommendations of BCAC are well received and well accepted. That shows, yesterday Mr. Vikram Kiloskar in his presentation, when he was talking in, uh, I think in NDTV, he said this government is in a listening mode, this government accepts, it listens and it implements. To that, some of the TV panelists said that I'm sure the government listens and if there is any problem, we will blame you. And joking, then Vikram Kiloska said, please pass it on to me. But the moot point is that I'm very happy to see that the government takes the input, inputs from every industry association, every person, 
that matters. Every person whom sir has got a valid points, the government takes their inputs very seriously and introspects and implements it. That's a very, very important from a government, but that's the second reason for my happiness. Because a government cannot deliver a budget without taking the input from the common man and taking input from everybody. And the government asks them that this budget is important. The third important aspect. Every time when the budget is presented or when the budget dates are likely to come, there is a euphoria or there is a gloom that is set upon by everybody that the government is going to increase the tax rates, the government will make a COVID says, the government is going to increase that says, this says, the government is going to introduce inheritance tax despite the government's repeated assurances that we are not going to tinker with the tax rates. And this is the government that has reduced the tax rates from 22 to 15% for manufacturing industry. Despite a repeated assurance and uh, commitment by the government that they will not increase the tax rate. But unfortunately, a section of the media and section of the people has been bringing a, a news that the government is going to introduce the inheritance tax rate, the government is going to tax the rich, the government is going to tax, may make the COVID cyst. But this government, again, it proved all the uh, rumors to uh, consign to the dustbin and they said they were not going to increase the tax rates. Imagine a situation where a pandemic crisis that has engulfed like this and there is a huge collection pressure in the revenue pressure, but the government has not resorted to even a single tax rate increase, which any other government, any other minister, any other finance minister would have done this. But this finance minister has not done any such attempts. At least on that point itself, I should give her a hundred percent marks because the government has not made even a single attempt to increase the tax rates for the purpose of meeting the expenditure. Rather, the government chose to spend money through a disinvestment and through the market borrowings, opening up of the bond market, strengthening of the market regulations for the bond market. All those things gives a perspective that the government is in the mood to raise the revenue through a non-tax collection, through other means not to touch the tax collection. Despite that, when I read the statistics today morning, the tax collections have gone up comparatively better than last year, though it is not as expected as what the government would estimate. But despite there's a slowdown, the collections in the corporate tax and other taxes have gone up. However, there is a small proposal to expand the tax base, which I'll come in my part of my panel discussion with Bala. But suffice to say that the government has not touched the tax rates because that's very, very important. Fourth important point, and that's one of the reasons for me to be happy. This country, India, can pick up a biggest economic power only if it unleashes its potential on three areas. And I have been having this view for quite some time and I've been articulating it as a shaker, as a partner, shaker as an individual and as a part of Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce. And it is also finding place in our BCAC recommendation as part of Atmanirbhar or the earlier recommendations on the COVID, how to revive the industry. Three or four important areas that we highlighted. Number one, we believe the chamber and as a professionals, we believe that Textile industry should be recognized and textiles industry should be given encouragement because textile industry is the largest employment creator in India after agriculture. And we also mentioned that the smaller countries are taking the uh, from the India on the entire textile market. The government should recognize the textile industry as the biggest employment generation. And it is our chamber which made a specific recommendation that you, we need, government should create textile parks across India. And we said that it should be created in four zones, south, north, east, and west, and central, five zones. You should create a textile parks, creating an ecosystem for the textile industry to get revived as it creates the biggest employment generation. And I'm happy to note that the finance minister in her speech said the government should create seven textile parks in the industry. That's a very, very mega investment because when you create such a parks of seven textile parks, you create an infrastructure which creates an employment. You bring a lot of textile industry, which again creates an employment. And again, in textile industry is one of the most Though it is unorganized, when organ when unorganized sector becomes organized, it creates more value to the society and it creates more employment generation, direct and indirect. To that extent, I commend the government for 
making a bold announcement of creating a seven textile parks. The second important recommendation, which part of BCAC and which God accepted, is on the infra. We have been having a view that making a road connectivity of 5,000 kilometers, 6,000 kilometers per annum is not sufficient to create what I would call a buoyancy in the infra and the industry. We are saying that you need to double it up either to 11,000 or 12,000 kilometers per annum. You need to create the road infra. Unless you create 11 to 12,000 kilometers of the connectivity, the infra will not get speeded up. And I'm happy the government made that point in this budget speech as well in the budget document that the government is committing to 11,000 kilometers of infra per annum. Again, a great move by the government. Third, we are always saying as a BCSC and as a person that there should be a focus on the health care because a country like India with the almost there's a huge divide between the rural and the urban. Unless the health care goes to rural and the improvement in the health policy, economic growth is not possible to achieve. And the government has recognized it. And the government is setting up a almost allocated 2 lakh crore for the health care with 35,000 crore for COVID vaccination. Again, a huge jump on the health care because moment you create that sort of health care infra, the direct and indirect employment generation and further followed by the insurance, all those things matters. I'm also happy to see that the government has increased the FDA ceiling on the insurance to 74 percent. So all those things matters when it comes to the health care. The last important point on the industry point again before uh, those scrappage policy has been tell, but another important point on the infra purposes. We also said that in addition to, sorry, education, we also said that the Indian has a, got a largest employment, largest pop, youngest population. To cater to the youngest population, you should recognize education as a sector and create more and more institutions with quality institutions to capture to the Indian industry, to the Indian government, to the India. And with the result, that sort of education institutions will create some sort of a huge employment potential by way of uh, providing a people to the industry. And we made a lot of recommendations in education, but one of the important recommendations, creating a huge allocation that is also fine placing in the government and focus on the education. So in that way, I'm as a person and as a professional, I'm happy on what the government has done on this budget and BCS recommendations have been accepted. The last important recommendation which was got accepted is on developmental financial institution. As a chamber, we advocate a developmental financial institution for infrastructure, a developmental financial institution for MSMEs and developmental financial institution for agriculture because one NABAD and one CB is not sufficient in this country to create that sort of impetus. And we also said that the government should create a developmental financial institution for infra and the government has allocated 25,000 crore with a more and uh, with a more with the state government model. So I'm happy, uh, sorry, with the participation with the various guests, the state government and also from the public private partnership model. I'm happy for the developmental financial institution. I'm sure DFIs will be another biggest what I would call uh, uh, a impetus for the infrastructure. Apart from all these things, there are other two, other two or three important announcements made by the government, which will create much more what I would call a strong wind in favor of the economic revival. The first, the outdated entire securities law in the form of Securities Contract Regulation Act, all those CB regulations are coming under one CB code, which will make sure that compliances are minimal, make sure what the government adheres to the, uh, make sure the government adheres to the say, famous adage, minimum law and uh, maximum governance. And that is what I hope the SEBI code will address it. I'm happy that the entire laws will come under SEBI code and it gets addressed and the government has proposed it. The second important aspect, under the company law, the government has made changes for making a one-man company and also increasing the size for the small size companies. That also gives a significant Im improvement for the entrepreneurs to set up the startup because today one of the important impediments for creating a startup for particularly for the NRIs or for the any individuals is a one man company because a digital innovation or a technology innovation is brainchild of one person. 
and for a one man company one person what is called the one person company under the company law there are certain impediments and that impediments are also being addressed under the sds budget the finance minister made a proposal so when i take the overall one infra public policy education and more focus on creating a solid ecosystem for the government for the industry to survive and have a peaceful coexistence and i believe what has been committed by the government is a great one a great promise by the government and a great commitment shown by the government key is on the implementation but i am extremely confident that this government led by the able prime minister certainly will steer clear of the implementation and will make sure that this budget gets implemented and i am sure if it gets implemented india will become a superpower in the next 3 years and of course we have the benefit of mr kamal bali who can talk about the benefits of infra benefits of a scrappage policy which has been a long pending demand of the automobile industry and also certain reductions in the customs duties to helping the msmes and other industries to follow of course there are few challenges few pointers which we need to take it forward i am sure bal has already started working on the post budget recommendations what should go to the government and we are very keen some of those measures which is little bit not in favor we are taking it to the government and i request every one of you to give what are the things that we need to take it to the government which bala and the team will work it around i already requested prithvi to reach out to the finance ministers both cabinet uh, both madam as well as mr anil uh, mr thakur the honorable minister of state for finance to request them for a deliberation to the bcse we are already reaching it out to them asking for a time i am sure we'll find a time in their calendar one of those days and definitely we'll come back to you but meanwhile if you have any specific points that you wanted the chamber to take it forward we'll be happy to take it thanks a lot for every one of us for joining i'll give more in my perspective when it comes to the panel discussion thanks a lot over to you, mr kamal yeah thank you shekhar uh, uh, thank you mr parshuram uh, i think uh, i i completely echo what you have said so i think you have made my job a lot easier i think you have you have said a lot of stuff which i would i would have said as well so completely in agreement and i think it's really i can say i can start by saying that it's finally appearing to be india's moment i mean the way this budget has been presented so let me let me uh, uh, step back a little and 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 trace the context in which this budget was being presented i think this is uh, something we should not forget that we were under very extraordinary uh, unprecedented circumstances an epoch making year uh, marked by the covid pandemic and uh, gdp was contracting for the first time in the last half century by almost 7 and 1/2 to 8 percentage points job creation and livelihoods was a growing concern all across uh, not only in india in many other countries and government was constantly seeking to address uh, several interventions and relief measures so i think in that context the budget was being presented and i must say uh, that uh, straight away uh, the, the 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 fm hit a uh, hit several sixes by coming out with a very bold audacious comprehensive caring thoughtful and a very transparent budget without putting anything under the carpet bringing out clearly the 9.5% uh, on the fiscal deficit uh, in fact like uh, like to like this would have been something around 8% the way it it has been calculated in the past so very very clearly so that's one very very clear thing uh so clearly what we can see is that the government has spent almost 29 to 30% more in fy21 versus fy um, fy20 which is roughly from 26 lakh crore to about 34 lakh crore uh, which is a clear clear uh, to manage uh, to manage this pandemic situation so clearly uh, it is in this context there was there were three main challenges which were uh, which were ahead of us in fact shekhar has very well articulated some of them to my mind the three challenges were lives livelihoods and creating sustainable growth to me 
they were these were the three uh, i would say mission themes which which one had to tackle so on lives i think very good answer i think the kind of uh, spend on health infrastructure at block level has been unprecedented and not only the money spent i think the the strategy the strategic direction to create the health in infrastructure and to make india uh, whether it is on nutrition on safe water sanitation all of this has been taken cognizance of and nutrition has been a very very big challenge when it came to preventive health so i think uh, th that also has been taken into cognizance cognizance so i think lives which was one something very crucial uh, several other vaccines are are in 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 process by june we will have two other vaccines and two vaccines are already there so i think this should make india very confident health conscious and aware of 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 the environment when it comes to all these pandemics so lives was the first challenge which which the government has addressed significantly obviously there is never enough we will constantly need to do more but very very pleased that government has boldly spent money on this the second challenge was livelihoods i think very very clearly as we all know that india needs jobs and economy needs skills that is a clear clear message in front of us that india needs jobs but the kind of jobs which, which are getting created we need different skills for those so i think the government has clearly focused on uh, on cre on generating jobs uh, to, to begin with so therefore therefore you can see huge amount of spend on infrastructure i think this is one of the biggest takeaways for me i think what what the what the uh, finance, honorable finance minister has done is she has taken cognizance of the multiplier effect which infrastructure has uh, compared to giving freebies instead of distributing money to people uh, through dbt or uh, giving uh, more uh, unemployment guarantee or universal basic income i think which 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 doesn't which is not productive at all which makes people lazy so the, what the government has done is really creating capital uh, formation for the country which will have multiplier if, multiplier effect over years and which can actually spur economic growth so huge amount of employment generation will happen through this uh, with the spirit of entrepreneurship and i think uh, with several other initiatives as uh, uh, shekhar has also mentioned i will not repeat uh, seven textile parks uh, focus on manufacturing uh, through through pli making the labor the four wage codes uh, 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 applicable and uh, uh, ease of doing business cost of doing business wage support uh, production link incentive and when it comes to uh, to manufacture to, to automotive industry a scrappage policy which i will discuss separately uh, in this so very very good focus on the second piece which is the very important piece on on livelihoods which is to create jobs uh, by way of productive measures on it by spending on infrastructure so from 26 lakhs crore uh, is going to be uh, the, the overall spend on, on the budget outlay the third piece which is a very important piece is sustainable growth how do you ensure sustainable growth and that is very very important how do we take uh, various sections of society together how do we ensure that there is equity there is societal equity there is care for planet there are there are issues on climate change how do we cat cater to those how do we really build brand india how do we focus on quality how, how do we focus on quality and and all of those so uh, I think, kamal, one, minute, one minute kamal one minute kamal may i request everybody to mute please because we are hearing a background noise uh, I, I request every one of the participant here, other than the speaker, to mute your phone, to mute your uh, laptop and computer, because we would not like to get disturbed when you are doing this an important session, please. I request every one of the participant here to comply with my humble request. Thank you so much. Go to your couple. Yeah. So, uh, so I was talking about the third element. Uh, the, I have talked about the, the first two lives and livelihoods. The third element is sustainable growth with, with next generation reforms. 
and i think this is something very critical if india has to become as shekhar said uh, a super power uh, a economic super power we need to indulge in next generation reforms and he has talked of dfi dis disinvestment uh, disinvestment uh, monetizing public property uh, so that all these assets which are sleepy assets they start sweating and they start monetizing themselves and giving lot of power to india whether it is in the area of uh, defense whether it is in the area of uh, uh, inclusive growth whether it is in in the area of innovation ai automation related to so so i think we need to look at this in a very big big way so when it comes to sustainable growth what we mean is that not only the planet we also look at equitable growth we we look at and therefore what government has shown clear i think a will and the courage of conviction to really uh, herald in some of the reforms uh, which 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 we can talk about in detail when we start our panel discussion but i think clearly for me it is a budget which clearly emphasized that it is india's moment and uh, of course there are as uh, as shekhar and parshuram has pointed there are going to be a few challenges in this uh, i can see uh, four major challenges i think number one uh, not not those not that these challenges are unsurmountable but none nonetheless these are challenges indeed number one raising the deficit financing without fueling inflation i think that is going to be one which i think the government has done very well in the in in the, in the current year and i am sure they will be able to manage this in the current year in the, in the next year as well the second is execution execution and execution and execution this is going to be key here the district level administration will have to really so we all will have to work as a team just a policy pronouncement is not only is not good enough we all as a team there the it is not only the responsibility of the government i think every stakeholder including organizations like all of us uh, bcic we all have to pull in our resources and i would say our resolve to really ensure that this this execution takes place at at ground level that is the second uh, challenge which which i see uh, again uh, not a unsurmountable challenge but challenge indeed the third is disinvestment uh, target uh, which which uh, because uh, we can see any any political uh, dispensation like india uh, the ruling party always runs into a political opposition when it comes to uh, efforts like uh, these uh, just like we have seen in the farmers protest and so i think that is a third challenge which which i see and the fourth of course is uh, more related to uh, industry and manufacturing that how do we upskill our people i think this is going to be another fourth thing if we are really talking of these uh, uh, for for the journey ahead so all in all highly impressed with this budget i am very bullish on india and i think manufacturing including the the scrappage policy and i think this is going to be another game changer are going to be the keys when it comes to manufacturing and to to spurring demand in the automotive sector the automotive sector especially the commercial vehicle industry and others are to uh, grow because they 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 are very closely correlated with the gdp growth if we look at gdp growing by 11 to 12% the automotive sector will grow uh, in a, in a very very strong way so we are very confident and last but not the least i i loved one um, another in uh, announcement by the by the finance minister uh, which actually got lost in in lot of other important um, announcements was looking restructuring the entire custom duty list the uh, by by september 2021 so that there are no issues of inverted duties which many times manufacturing sector faces so very very clear glide path on component duty on on intermediary duty and on the finished good uh, custom duty many times we we have seen uh, several aberrations i think this is another thing which which uh, which the government wants to clear the work is already started i would request pcc bcic to form a committee to work with the government and be part of this journey with the government when they are doing this correction 
and also on GST rationalization. I think these are two announcements which got lost in the din of major announcements, which the government has promised over the next uh, three to six months they are going to uh, re review and look at. So overall, very comprehensive budget, very caring, very audacious, very bold and very transparent budget. Uh, congratulations to the finance minister. I stop here. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Kamal sir, for this wonderful uh, uh, analysis that you have given to us. Uh, may I now invite uh, Mr. Lakshmi Narayan uh, KR, the Chief Endowment Officer from Aziz Premji Foundation, to kindly give you a keynote address. Sir. Over to you. Thank you, Prithvi, uh, and uh, thanks to everybody. It's a it's a privilege to be a part of this uh, discussion and an even greater honor uh, to be asked to share my thoughts as part of a keynote. Um, this, uh, I, I let me start off by giving my one line summary of this budget, which is a, it's a test match and it's a it's a it's a budget for the test match. And similar to test match, the fact that I'm coming down as, as a two down batsman has made my life a lot easier because many of the points that uh, require uh, to be talked off, to be highlighted, have been covered by Mr. Shaker as well as uh, Mr. Kamal. However, I, I will try and provide some some of my own perspectives on these, uh, and I'll try and do that um, uh, quickly so that we have enough time for our discussions and uh, questions that come through in the panel discussion. Um, as I finished the speech, uh, as I finished listening to the speech and uh, looking at the first cut documents that came on everybody's WhatsApp feeds or whichever platform you use, those feeds. My, my, my first reaction was that uh, this is a uh, what uh, in good old technology terms we used to say a wissy wig budget. Uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, and after a long time, there was very little one had to do in terms of, I think the first reaction was everyone said, let's look at the fine prints. And let's look at what is hidden. It can't be so good. There was no shock and awe. Uh, which is normally associated uh, with budget. And I think just for the fact that it was anything, everything that had to be said uh, was said and nothing that needed to be said was not said itself is such a such a big positive to me. And, and that was a great thing. This, the, other, the other thought that came to my view also was that as a trained accountant, uh, in some sense, this was an accountant's budget. Uh, and by, by that, what I mean is that it's a very highly conservative budget. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, in some sense, we had a precursor to what was coming, of course, with the benefit of hindsight, when we saw the economic survey document. Uh, the economic survey this time was a very interesting document. Most of the time it is. But very often, the economic survey in the recent past have had less connection to the budget. They have been more generic, uh, broad term kind of thought process on the economy. But this time, uh, the economic survey talked of many things and I think I just want to take up three things that it talked of uh, which I think had a direct but a bearing on what came in uh, uh, the next working day effectively. The first was that the economic survey this time said that you have to prioritize wealth creation over redistribution. Uh, in, a, in our economy we've often been conflicted as policy makers, as governments, as finance ministers between this thing about creating wealth and distributing wealth and we have swung the pendulum every now and then. The economic survey clearly said that you need to create wealth and then start distributing it so the prioritization had to be given to that. The second aspect that the economic survey talked of was that there was a need to invest in health. Um, while COVID was a global shock, what it also exposed was that our health infrastructure was really in pretty bad shape and you needed to invest a lot, especially for a uh, for a society and economy that has so much young people who have to be very productive. You need to have good, good health infrastructure to keep them healthy and going. And therefore, it had talked of the need to sort of go up to 2.5% of GDP uh, in health and that was the focus on health was very clearly there. And the third was that the extreme times call for extreme measures. And the whole hint saying that these are times when 
what you need to do uh, for the economy is more important than this whole thing about artificial fiscal forbearance uh, was also sort of talked about in the economic survey. So in some sense, there were many others, of course, but these three sort of came right through uh, into the budget and we can see how the whole thing has come down. So very much the, the economic survey was a great precursor to what the budget was going to uh, deliver and that's exactly what it did. Now let me talk a little bit about my thing on the conservative side. The revenue estimate, uh, uh, the, the, the net tax revenue in this budget is planned at a 15% growth. So the expectation in net tax revenue is a 15% growth. Considering the fact that you're going to have a 11% GDP growth, uh, we are talking of an, even a nominal inflation of, let's say, the, the between 3 and 4%. Uh, we are getting, talking about nominal growth of about 14, 15%. We are already seeing the uptick on, on, on the GST collection that have come in the numbers, most recent numbers of 1,20,000 crores seem to show a strong recovery. The V-shape now recovery in the economy is now well accepted. If you as, as investors, we sort of track companies and look at the earnings uh, estimate, we are seeing very strong earnings growth coming to the companies. It's, it's coming in FI. Uh, 21 was a good surprise, but FI22 is looking again at a very, very strong revenue uh, the growth for profit growth and revenue growth. So there's going to be volume growth and re revenue growth for many, many companies. So essentially, we are seeing an economy that's coming back into action, but the estimates on tax revenue have been kept at just 15%. Now that I think is a very is very conservative, and I think we will see some. Uh, surprises on that on the positive side. I also hope that this particular aspect of having a realistic uh, uh, tax uh, revenue will, tar will translate to realistic targets for officers and therefore <clears throat> all the stuff that we have heard of in the past of people talking of tax terrorism etc. Those kind of perverse incentives will not be there and we will see a much much smoother uh, thing on that basis. So that's a, a bonus but fundamentally we are going to, I think we will see a positive surprise on the revenue side. Um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the, then let me talk a little about fiscal deficit because there's a lot of talk about fiscal deficit, 6.8% uh, for next year, 9.5% for this year. Now the reality is that the street, uh, the, the expectation on the street was that it will be in the range of what, whatever, for next year it will be 5.5% or so, this year it will be up 7, 7.5%. Uh, and then 9.5 and 6.8 suddenly look like large numbers. But I think again, coming, coming back to the conservative and the, the, and the VC big part of it, a la large part of increase in this deficit is due to on balance sheeting of the off balance sheet item. So the entire dues to FCI, which was an off balance sheet item in the budget for several years, has now come into the balance sheet, both in the actuals for uh, uh, FI21 uh, and in the budget for FI22. So therefore, adjusted for that, I would think that the fiscal deficit number will really veer around to what pretty much was an expectation. So it's a very it's a it's a smart move because it it brings in that into the balance sheet, but it's also extremely eminently explainable. So some of the concerns that I have read I have heard in the last uh, 24 hours of uh, of worries on uh, rating agencies, I think is, are overstated because rating agencies always see through this on balance sheet and off balance sheet and they will find that apart from this being an extraordinary year, they will see through this and they will sort of take it in, in a positive thing. So, but the move to transparency uh, is I think an excellent move and we should really commend that uh, uh, to the finance minister. Uh, the third thing I want to talk about is health and everyone's talked about the investments in health. And I just want to focus on just two things which I think are very, very interesting in, to me in the health investments. Uh, everyone's seen that 137% increase in uh, uh, health versus B of 2021. But I think what was fascinating was when you looked into the detail, close to the, the total expenditure on health is expected to be 2,23,000 crore uh, rupees or so. Nearly 1 lakh crore of that is in the area of water, sanitation and nutrition. So again, this is while there's a lot of talk on 
you know health clinics and testing facilities and labs and nothing they're all required and uh, and i'll come back to the health in a in, will in a moment a lot of 1 lakh crore out of the 2 lakh 23000 crore is going into fundamentals water sanitation and things like that which i think is again a very very uh, good fundamental long term move again going back to my analogy this is a test match it's not something like a t20 where you want to look at immediate uh, results the second aspect of health i do want to focus upon is this thing on vaccination i did a quick back of the envelope calculation currently the government is procuring vaccines at 200 rupees uh, from serum institute that's what they have sort of uh, said there are few more are the there are two are approved and few more are in the pipeline and you have to build infrastructure and thing even i assume, if i assume that per dose the cost is 600 rupees right the three times so we are saying 200 is a basic cost but all put together there will be a 200 percent overheads on that so it's 600 rupees and each person has to be given two doses right even keeping that in mind this budget is enough to vaccinate close to 30 crore people that's nearly one fourth of our population that is a massive number and given the fact that the finance minister and the secretaries in their various interactions have said that we will give more that is required i think we will actually see uh, a solid effort and and subject to the execution point that uh, mr kamal talked of again we will see a solid implementation on the vaccination program which is again very good for the economy and it's in its journey of recovery so these are two aspects on this on on health that i wanted to highlight quickly moving on to the thing on uh, cap the other the other positive things on the capital expenditure which i want to talk about the proposed capital expenditure this year is going to be 5 lakh 50 thousand crores a 26 percent increase over the revised estimates of last year the current year this translates to about 2.5 percent of gdp and if you include the capital expenditure proposed for autonomous bodies, it's nearly 3.4% of GDP. Now, if you apply an ICOR incremental capital output ratio 4.5, which is what economists do, this capex alone can spur GDP growth by 0.75%. So we are talking, looking at a situation where we're going to see a, 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 a close to 1% increase in GDP coming just from the capex uh, thing of it. More importantly, if you look at the thrust of the capex and the breakdown of the capex a lot of capex is focused around roads and railways where there is a greater chance and greater opportunity for the central government to control the execution going back to the point that was made earlier by both mr shaker and uh, uh, mr kamal saying that execution is a very important part of what we'll, we'll be looking for i think that there's the probability, the way it's been structured, the way it's been designed, I think there's a greater, greater chance of the whole thing working out. So I think on an on, on, on on a overall basis, I think we're going to see a positive surprise on, 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 on revenues, on, on the revenue front. How they will use that is going to be up for grabs. Either that will result in a positive surprise in the fiscal deficit, which means that it won't be 6.8, but lesser, which will be a great positive surprise. Or it can mean that they can spur they can spur greater expenditure which again can be great for the economy how that will play out is something that i think will be worth watching over the next few months um just to close out i just i do want to talk of certain challenges and i think a couple of them have already been referred to uh, by uh, mr kamal uh, the first obviously is the highest ever disinvestment target we have a disinvestment target of 1 lakh 75 thousand crores we've never achieved that amount for the current year, we'll achieve only 10% of our dis disinvestment target, in spite of the fact that we've perhaps had some of the best runs in, uh, in, in the financial markets. We've not been able to achieve that. How we will execute on that is something that we have to watch very, very carefully. Uh, I don't know whether there's a soft assumption of an under underachievement here and an overachievement in revenues. I don't know about that. But this is if they do manage to get this through with the revenue assumption, I think it's going to be a great thing for the economy. Uh, the second thing is uh, again on the borrowing front uh, we are going to look at a situation based on the borrowing program that the government has laid out that there's going to be a borrowing of between 30 and 40 thousand uh, crores uh, every week that the government has to borrow uh, roughly translating the 12 lakh into this that is a massive thing and that's a that's going to be a big challenge for rbi and rbi will have to manage it deftly to ensure that both on the inflation front and the interest rate front 
uh, things are calibrated and they are kept at, under control so that the economy doesn't get derailed by uh, a black swan kind of a factor. These are things that are in the immediate. On a more fundamental point, uh, I think uh, we, I talked of health before, and I think health, we do need to invest a lot more in health. And uh, as we need to on, on education, I'll talk a little bit about both of those. On health front, uh, adjusted for what we are doing on water sanitation, which is a very great thing, but it's still not core health, as some purists might say. Uh, the health investment adjusted for what's going into water sanitation is still going to be something like about 0.35% uh, uh, of GDP up from about 0 0.25, 0 0.28. So we are still far away from the 2.5% that we need. And I think that is something that uh, will, will is, a, is, a, is a journey in progress. We made the first step of a journey of 1,000 steps, but we have a long way to go. We have to realize that that, that journey is still there. Similarly, on education, we have a, a, announced a very ambitious new education policy, which is a great uh, policy that we've come after nearly uh, 38 years. To execute that, we will need no. Government has taken the first step by saying that they'll have 15,000 schools that they will provide for, uh, which will have, which will fully implement the NEP. Great, good step, given that uh, school education is a state subject, but we must keep the perspective in mind that India has 15 lakh schools. So 15,000 is a drop in the ocean. We have a long way to go even on that. Finally, we must remember while this is a great time, and I think there's a lot of good things and it's a lot of positive momentum that we are seeing on all that. We must remember that even prior to COVID, we were coming off a very difficult economy. Uh, and but there were many challenges that I'm sure all of us as members in BCIC will remember and kind of relate to. One of the challenges was definitely on job creation. While this budget will do a lot to do to, to create jobs over a period of time, we will not see results immediately. How we manage that, how we manage to structurally set our economy right while creating things that we need in the short run is another challenge that is going to face. But like it was said before, you can't please all. It's a tough thing to do. And under these tough circumstances, we've had a budget that has had very few shocks. And that itself is a very positive surprise. I'll stop here and share more in our panel discussion. Thank you once again for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Lakshmi, sir, for this uh, wonderful insights that you've given on the analyzing the post budget. Uh, now we, uh, we move on to the panel discussion. Uh, I request Mr. K. Balasalonin, Chairman of the Direct Tax Export Committee, BCIC and Vice President and Global Head Corporate of Tax Vipro Limited to kindly take over for the panel discussion, sir. Over to you, Bala, sir. Prithi, you have to unmute Bala. Please unmute yeah, Bala. Yeah, I, I, am, I am unmuted. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And uh, uh, good morning to, uh, to all of you. Uh, thanks for joining all of us. I think uh, Lance said he's too down. Uh, probably I'm a tail ender here or probably even a night watchman. Uh, my job is very difficult because uh, you know all the questions that I had jotted down uh, have already been touched by uh, you know all three of you, Shekhar, uh, Kamal sir, and Lan. You, uh, but you know I'll I'll try and uh, uh, you know not spoil the mood here because you know my job here is to look at the fine print and uh, put some difficult questions. Uh, you know while all of you have praised the budget. Uh, I, I thought I'll I'll point out some nuances and uh, you know understand it in the right perspective and uh, th that's what uh, you know I'll try and do over the course of next 40 minutes or so I think we'll uh, we'll we'll target about 40 minutes. We are also joined by uh, uh, you know two other uh, experts, Baskar from Indirect Taxes and uh, Rukmi uh, Majumdar, uh, an economist from the Deloitte. Uh, we'll also have uh, their perspective uh, uh, also on uh, you know some of the uh, nuances here. Uh, first, sir, I'll I'll start off with uh, uh, Kamal Bali, ba sir. Uh, Bala, sir. Even Sunil Dareshwar has joined. Can we also look at him? Yes, absolutely. Sunil uh, uh, Sunil is part of uh, uh, you know the direct tax committee, and he's the tax head of Infosys. Uh, we will take his industry perspectives as well. Uh, you know on on the, on the budget. Thank you, uh, Thank you. sir. Uh, uh, Kamal, sir, uh, you know you you uh, you know you represent uh, um, you know in a manner of speaking the infrastructure uh, uh, you know side of the industry, uh, and um, um, you know 
fortunately there is lot of focus on infrastructure as uh, you know all of you have pointed out uh, what stands out is uh, uh, you know the scrappage policy or or even on the public transport uh, you know there is a there is a, a talk about innovative ppp model uh, that interoperable public transport and i think this is one of the challenges which has led to a lot of congestion on the roads so when we talk of sustainable transport uh, we we generally get crowded by the fact that we are talking of electric vehicles so sustainable transport is not only about electric vehicles or clean transport it is also how do we manage the congestion part how do we manage to move people from point a to point b in a very very efficient manner so so we have to look at the last mile connectivity we have to look at uh, a metro we have to look at uh, public transport in the form of buses so i think that's one uh, area which we have been talking uh, at length with the government and i'm happy that government has decided to uh, invest in about 20000 buses uh, to augment the public transport infrastructure from the central government level so th that's that's one piece uh, because that's that's also related to uh, the mobility of people and the efficiency in the entire ecosystem that's one the i want to touch upon uh, for a, for a few uh, seconds on on the scrappage policy i think the scrappage policy is going to be a game changer uh, not only to spur demand for automotive sector but also to actually indulge into circular economy which means there are lots of uh components and parts which can be recycled and i think that's something which is going to be the key a lot of metal a lot of plastics a lot of rubber can be recycled and i think this can actually spur a new industry altogether and uh, and this could be a game changer and that's where i come and say that a lot of new jobs will be created and and i think uh, our economy needs lot of upskilling and that is where we will need to really change our mindsets and that is where scrappage policy will become a very very important piece and that's and that's why the government has taken a lot of time in actually coming out finally with the scrappage policy it is still uh, work in progress it is not yet final uh, but i think this is going to be a very interesting piece while you spur demand for new like private vehicles after 20 years of usage and public vehicles after 15 years but you also recycle and reuse which could be which could end up in lot of savings and a new in industry altogether so that's the second bit the third part i want to very quickly talk about is manufacturing and to me that is i'm most passionate about about the manufacturing piece because uh, this to me is going to be again another game changer because this is india's manufacturing moment when more than 4 trillion dollars out of 15 trillion dollars of manufacturing output is going to be rebalanced and is going to move out of china and we could be one of the key contenders our total manufacturing output is less than half a trillion now this four out of this 4 trillion if we can get just 1 trillion we can we can actually become a 1.5 trillion manufacturing economy alone over the next 4 to 5 years and this is an opportunity like never before so whatever needs to be done whether it is ease of doing business labor labor codes land uh, cost of doing business ease of doing business i think all of this needs to be done so therefore these are my three important points and we we will elaborate on those later thank you lan uh, you know you know if i if i get you here you know you talked about uh, uh, you know a, a transparency and an allocation do you think that uh, you know so much has been talked 
about infrastructure is there sufficient allocation of funds uh, you know going into it of course we saw that rebalancing in terms of the capex being given importance but if you look at metro uh, while there's a lot of allocation and a lot of projects being announced but uh, if you look at the amount of spend it's about you know 18000 crores which was same as 1920 so you know i don't think there's any incremental uh, spend which has gone into the metro uh, projects uh, likewise even if you look at other uh, you know projects the spend is almost same uh, so you know is it like you know what kamal sir mentioned about rebalancing and therefore it gets into uh, newer and newer uh, uh, sectors which will spur the growth or how how do you look at this lan you are muted lan your line is muted i think that thank you uh, it's a great point bala and i think the way i, I sort of think about it is that there, there are three aspects to this the first is you know the the the, the intent versus execution uh, I think all of, and and let's face it, budgets are statements of intent, and all of us look at how the execution happens, and very often that is when some disappointments come in. So, so from that point of view, the fact that uh, so that's one aspect of so saying that it's it's been uh, it's it, that has not happened in the past, and there's hope that this will happen better. The second is uh, the fact that uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, where they have done this expenditure. Uh, I think there's a 26% increase in railways, 26% increase in uh, roads, and about 150% increase in urban. Uh, in some sense, many of these are more under control of the central government in some ways or the other. So that is where the hope is bringing that there can be a better execution part of it. Okay. And third, we have to appreciate is that many all infrastructure things in India uh, as a democracy, and I think we will execution poses challenges on the ground and uh, and and that is is a, a combination of uh, what i said a, a democracy the challenge of a democracy and legislative intent and of course the various on the ground uh, problems that we face so we have to keep these three things together so that is why i had also talked of saying execution included these two points on the execution front but my hope is more from the first point which is that more of these expenditure plan are in the ho hopefully more relatively more under the control of central and therefore they might be able to execute it better uh, is the hope yeah but that's a point well taken sir kamal sir coming back to you you uh, you know you laid a lot of importance on the skills uh, and that's that's going to also uh, you know uh, make the foundation for employment generation and uh, we saw announcements like uh, you know research foundation being given uh, being set up with some 50000 crores over 5 years uh, of course on the uh, the the, uh, the there's a education commission which is also being uh, uh, you know uh, looked at uh, so what are your thoughts on the skill development and the, you know what what uh, your perspectives from an industry side uh, where uh, we can supplement these efforts yeah, Bana, this is uh, uh, one of the very good questions and actually uh, something to introspect and uh, work together as a team. And I think to my mind, the new edu this should be under the gambit of the new education policy, wherein um, uh, maybe after class eight or class nine or class 10, a vocational education kicks in. And I think that's something going to be very, very important. And it's going to be the job of industry, uh, the new education policy, and some of the state actors to work in tandem to really train and and uh, skill India for the new jobs, for the new economy. And I think that's going to be the key. This cannot be left alone uh, either to the government or to the academic institutions. So there has to be a very good orchestra play between uh, industry, academia and the government to really skill India for the new jobs. And I think to my mind, uh, there has to be a renewed focus and some new thinking uh, and innovation on how do we impart that education and vocational training to our young youngsters. Because if we really want to reap the demographic dividend, that is the only way we cannot just let these boys and girls come into the into the into the workforce 
without being trained, formally trained uh, to be ready for the, those jobs. So I think to my mind, this is the uh, most in, interesting challenge which, which both industry bodies like BCIC, CII and uh, uh, the government state actors have to perform together and let this be part of companies' budgets and let uh, maybe six months to one year for every child be, be spent in one of the companies uh, if, if they are interested in, in taking that, that, uh, that, that area of work. So I think that to my mind, this is very critical and uh, this has to be a national mission and it has to be done on a mission mode. So, so this is very critical and uh, important. Yeah. Lan, uh, before I move on to others on the panel, I just want to get your perspective on this critical aspect of education, because I think apart from there's a lot of things spoken on healthcare and infrastructure, I think there's a lot of focus on education in this budget. And, you know, the precursor to that was the education policy. And, uh, uh, you know, the Azim Premji Foundation was also very uh, intimately involved with the government on this. Uh, you know, and if you look at the allocation, the allocation has gone up, uh, you know, at least uh, one notch up, right? Three and a half percent of GDP, uh, you know, towards education. What was like, you know, two, two and a half percent. It's now three and a half percent suddenly. Uh, and, you know, focus on apprenticeship training schemes, etc. Uh, so, you know, do you think that the focus is going in the right direction on this, uh, you know, and what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I think one of the uh, interesting backgrounds to this was the fact that uh, unlike earlier when they were looking at uh, education and the, and the allocation to education uh, as, as a budgetary exercise, this time they had a broader blueprint, which is the new education policy. So the new education policy clearly laid out what are the priorities and therefore the execution, the allocation, the setting up the, high, the education commission are all part of that policy and so that it's really getting implemented and that is something that a high priority for this government and so that's that's clearly going on that but i would like to to sound a word of caution here uh, under the constitution education is a concurrent subject so to make this whole thing on education and new education policy a success will require pulling together of both the central government and the state government and it would not only be unreal but also unfair to expect the entire thing to be uh, heavy lifted by the central government and even within that for it to be heavy lifted by the budget. So with that proviso said, have, having said that, I think we have got a blueprint that we are executing on. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Lan. Uh, Ruk Rukmi Majumdar, uh, you know, let me get you here, madam. Um, uh, can we see you? Are you? Yeah, absolutely fine. Hi, how are you? Uh, you know, uh, from a, you know, I think Lan also talked about uh, transparency in, uh, you know, in an accountant's budget, uh, uh, you know, kind of an allocation which has happened. Uh, and she has, you know, kind of bite the bullet of uh, the larger fiscal deficit, uh, you know, which is like, uh, you know, we have not seen this kind of a fiscal deficit. But once you, you know, parse into the numbers and see, uh, much of this deficit is coming from, uh, uh, you know, the, the food uh, subsidy, which was uh, off balance sheet and, uh, you know, she has brought it into the budget this, this year. And uh, this year is a kind of two year absorption of, uh, uh, you know, the subsidy. Uh, and therefore, when you look at this nine and a half percent, it's really not, uh, you know, uh, is, is something which is new to the economy, right? Because this was always there in the economy and economy has absorbed this in some form or fashion. Um, so, what is what is your uh, thoughts from an you know from an economist angle, and uh, was this the right time to do do this, or this nine and a half percent of fiscal space that she had, she could have done it for something else as well? Because this this particular portion is not going to go into the economy and spur uh, you know any demand or productivity that uh, that is uh, that is that is, that it could have had a multiplier effect if it was done in something else. So, what are your thoughts on this? So uh, what I would like to comment the government is that the government has uh, actually come very has been very honest about it rather than hiding everything uh, under the carpet like she has been she has come clean and uh, the fact remains that government is the deficit is nine and a half percent not just because of the off balance sheet but the fact that the government is also spending high 
the revenue itself is kind of come down because of low economic activity and most importantly it's a math right so it's a percentage of gdp if your gdp itself is so low then your numerator is high uh, is lower so your ratio is going up so it's a function of several other variables so off, probably off balance sheet could have contributed two two and a half or maybe three percent but the fact remains that the rest of the six and a half or seven percent that we are seeing uh, that the huge jump is because of the higher expenses that the government had to do to support lives and livelihood and which is a commendable move because uh, uh, india is a re uh, resource starved nation to to begin with and uh, it, it doesn't have the endless uh, resources or uh, limitless resources to spend but despite the fact that the uh, government had a had a budget estimate of three and a half percent from there it has gone all the way to seven and a half percent this is uh, that kind of shows the uh, the determination of the government to do what it what it what it uh, takes to do to support lives and support livelihoods and the economy so uh, coming clean being honest putting it out to the investor that yes we are going to have a very high fiscal deficit so you know what your risks are but the fact remains is it is not going to alarm the investors uh, in a way because i think every other country is doing that i mean we are not an exception every other country is kind of spiking including germany who have been uh, who have been proponent of austerity and they are themselves are kind of bumping up their deficits big time so if it it, it is uh, in fact we if had had we not had a high deficit people were, uh, investors would have worried that the government support is not enough so in a way it is a good uh, indication or a guidance from the government to say that we are there and we will do whatever to support so that's something and and it will not probably translate into uh, into a, a currency or financial instability because uh, because uh, uh, because of the fact that uh, um, it's uh, the the expenses that the government is doing is on quality infrastructure and on quality in creating assets and which will have long term uh, returns so uh, investors do understand that and the, uh, and uh, that would help uh, investors to come um, improve confidence and invest in in, in 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 the country thank you thank you shaker if i if i can get you here you know historically you know we have seen uh, uh, very tough targets on tax revenues uh, while the economy will grow at 15%, the tax revenue will be, uh, you know, going at 25%, at least in the budget. That will put a lot of pressure on, you know, the the tax uh, uh, tax man to go after industries and, you know, pressurize them. Uh, but, you know, as as uh, we, we see it, uh, it's, it's a modest 15% uh, growth, which is assumed on the tax revenues. Uh, as Lan pointed out, uh, you know, is this something being... Uh, uh really modest about it uh, and so that you know if there is any shortfall in other uh, uh, collections uh, you can always uh, piggyback on the tax revenue uh, but do you really see that the administration is changing in terms of the transparency in terms of uh, you know various initiatives on dispute resolution the faceless methodologies uh, that are being introduced in both assessments appeals etc uh, we are going to see a sea change, uh, uh, you know, in the administration, uh, which is also reflected in the in the budget process in terms of what has gone into the tax revenue. Thanks, Bala. Thank you so much. In fact, historically, we I have come across, and all of us have come across that whenever the government was looking for a collection or revenues, they always increase the tax rates. They always increase the surcharge. They increase the sales. They increase the base tax rates. Or they used to tinker the rates of dividend distribution tax or minimum alternative tax to get that collection. But first time I'm seeing no changes in the tax rates despite crisis what has created through the due to the pandemic. Now, one of the people are yesterday a lot of people have been debating how the government is going to find the sources, how it's going to find the resources, how it is going to get the collection, where it is going to get. Yes, as Kamal was mentioning, as Lan was mentioning, as I was mentioning, the government is more looking to the non-tax areas like privatization of public sector and other investment, and also private and railway corridors and railway lands. The government is looking at the non-tax areas for resources. Having said that, when it comes to the tax collection, the buoyancy factor is 1.4 percent is going by the Minister of Revenue Secretary's yesterday's comments. 
the buoyancy factor is 1.4 percentage. Now, if you look at it from the tax angle, uh, the rates have not gone up, but the government believes the change in the economy and the way the government is going to push the infra and other spending, the economy will revive, which will create more good for the industry. And with the result, there will be more tax collection in the form of the performance of the industry rather than the increasing the rates of the taxes. That's the way the government is looking at it. It is a very positive, very optimistic approach. The second one is that the government has also expanded in the current year a little bit the tax net by introducing their tax deducted at source on some of the transactions like buying and selling of goods, they introduce the TDS. Uh, to what extent it is going to add up the revenue is a matter of guess, but at least the government has expanded the TDS network. Uh, the third aspect is that, yes, there is a lot of changes in the tax administration the government is making at them, faceless assessment, faceless appeals, uh, extending a dispute resolution for the small taxpayers, up to 50 lakhs you can go for a uh, dispute resolution headed by some independent person for bringing down the reassessment uh, period. So quite a lot of measures and, and he tribal the government is attempting it across. So the government is focusing more on the tax administration and, and, and uh, if if it gets really translated into an act, uh, uh, action, if it gets really get into implementation, what I personally believe you will not have an artificial demands and artificial collection drive what is come what was there earlier at least there will be a collection drive for a genuine tax defaults genuine issues which is i always appreciative of it but do not force an artificial collection the artificial demand so to that extent the government is more focusing on the administration and i hope the faceless assessment and the faceless appeal and also the new proposal for the faceless tribunal and creating a in fact, one of the uh, we, are, we have been asking for a private rulings for all the tax issues. The government started coming out with a, a independent body for board of advance rulings for a small tax base. So all those things are leading towards a better tax administration. And and I'm sure all of us will agree it's very difficult to overhaul the tax administration in a period of one year. You need two to three years down the line uh, to overhaul the tax administration. And, and the government is making a serious attempt of, attempt on that. If that gets addressed and if more transparency comes in, which I believe it will come in, then to that extent it should not create a problem. Okay. Thank you, Shikha. Uh, Sunil, if I if I can get you here, uh, you know, from an industry perspective. Sunil, yeah, hi. Uh, Sunil, from an industry perspective, uh, you know, on the direct tax proposals, uh you know what what one or two things that uh, uh you know you would like to touch upon uh certainly from from my perspective i thought that the uh, goodwill and the reassessment procedures are something that uh, uh you know of interest would be of interest to industry what are your thoughts on uh, on the sunil yeah so um am i audible Banan? yes you are okay um, so I think, uh, you know, first of all, um, you know, overall a general assessment, like, you know, everyone has said, it's been a, a very good budget in the current circumstances. And, um, you know, in over 20 odd years of what we've been dealing with, you know, budgets, uh, I don't think we've ever seen a budget where there's hardly been any changes in, you know, tax rates or slabs, et etc. So I think, that's wonderful. Um, like we've always said, we need certainty in taxes, which is more, you know, at least in the medium term. So it's good to see a budget where, you know, rates have not been changed. And that's been an ask of the industry for many, many years, uh, investors as well, that uh, we need to have a consistent, you know, tax policy. So to that extent, I think it's welcome that uh, there's not been any change in the rates. Um, having said that, I think uh, I do uh, agree with you. The one uh, item that has changed and, you know, I think that's something that is going to have an impact, especially for uh, inorganic growth of, uh, you know, organizations which do, you know, M&A activities. Uh, and especially if there are instances where, you know, there are industries that are not doing well and, you know, who are possibly, you know, into liquidation, et cetera, and you want to revive them. Um, I think it was a very good, uh, you know, while it was from a tax perspective, it was helpful 
where you would get a uh, benefit of the goodwill depreciation i think that's one item that um, you know will not be available but having said that i think you know tax you know should not be the driver i think the business should be the driver in any you know mnda kind of an activity so i think to that extent um, you know things will still happen i don't think just because the benefit of goodwill is being taken away i don't think it will change the behavior in terms of the mnda activity so i don't think it's going to have an impact as such obviously you know for your tax practitioners and advisors uh, they'll have to come up with some other way of you know seeing how they manage the effective tax rate so i think the challenge is you know back to to the tax uh, you know fraternity um on the item on um, i think overall if you ask me i think the points on you know compliances which shaker touched upon i think is is very welcome um again execution is what we would need to look at uh, a lot of the policy statements are are good but even on reassessments where it's brought down to 3 years i'm hoping that in an execution you know it will not be seen that you know people will uh, you know tax officers would try and say that there has been you know income that has not been disclosed or there has been deliberate you know um your attempt at uh, you know holding back uh, income and therefore taking the route of the 10 years so again from an execution perspective i think it's important that it follows through at the ground level um so i think in that sense uh, it's been good uh, i think the government has you know ensured that they have not gone you know to different uh, industry board, uh, lobbies etc so i think they've stayed away from that i think that's uh, you know very welcome in terms of being fairly you know neutral in the way they have you know done the execution in terms of uh, the budgets uh, you know in terms of allocations uh, etc um the only thing which i thought you know could have been done given that we've been talking about atmanirbhar and all of that and i know a lot of industries have always sought uh, benefits and exemptions and all of that um i thought maybe you know from an r and d perspective you know there could have been something that could have been done uh given that we do want to make um, india not just uh, a manufacturing place but more of an innovation as well i think that's one area where you know r and d should be kind of um, you know um, uh, encouraged uh, maybe that's something that could have been done but uh, again um you know like shaker said not everything can be done in one budget hopefully you know as we go along you know some of these uh, is something that we can see okay we have anyway seen you know four five mini budgets last year as a reaction to uh, you know what happened last year uh, so if if i think uh, uh, you know the 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 situation warrants they may not hesitate uh, is 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 what the finance minister also mentioned right uh, you know I, 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 moving on you know to into indirect taxes baskar uh you know generally after the introduction of gst uh, we have not seen uh, you know much changes on the indirect taxes side but this year i would say that the finance bill more than 60% of the pages are occupied by uh, uh, you know the indirect taxes of course much of it on, is on the customs duty rate rationalization etc uh, but what about the cess the agriculture and infrastructure cess uh of course uh, uh, you know one other thing which stands out is uh, what mr uh, kamal bali also uh, you know pointed out the rationalization of the exemptions and the rates on the customs duty side and uh, two or three uh, important but nuanced changes in the gst one on exports uh, etc so you know in summary what are your thoughts on uh, the gst uh, and the indirect taxes changes yeah thanks uh, bala if you just look at the custom there are many changes and uh, one of the change which is uh, way different from what used to happen in the previous regime says or in the previous budget whenever there is a customs not notification exemption that remains for eternity until specifically resigned it now this government may be is thought that there could be sub bit of a subvention or an exemption only for a period of 2 years so one of the ask uh, is uh, for the trade and industry is to just go and review all your exemption notifications and if you have to just modify your pricing structure go ahead and do it keeping in mind these notifications will not last long it will be only for a 2 years it has a shelf life 
and also the finance minister very specifically mentioned that 400 exemption notifications will be reviewed so make sure that you're on top of those exemption notification and if it is being resigned that uh, we need to just uh, adjust that in the uh, pricing that is one thing which uh, definitely uh, one has to do uh, the other thing is uh, in terms of the customs um, now um, again it must be from an ease of doing business you know that india is at 63rd india wants to be within top 50 um, you need to file a bill of entry at least one day in advance prior to the arrival of shipment yeah we are we are moving away from T plus one to T minus one. That is something which is a very, very welcome thing and people should uh, really make use of this. And it, it's not not only making use of it, it's mandated by the uh, customs authority. That is uh, two uh, big changes. And of course, there were uh, the AIDC has been introduced, but at the same time, the basic, the corresponding customs duties have been reduced. So there is no net increase in terms of uh, the incidence, duty incidence. But of course, uh, the AID, AIDC is earmarked for a specific purpose in terms of agriculture infrastructure development. So this is again welcome, unlike in the past where CES was incremental in nature for the importers or the for the suppliers. Coming back to GST, Bala, if you just see, uh, I don't know it's a welcome measure or it's something to be worried about. Your GST audit is gone. Yeah. When I'm saying GST audit is gone, section 35, subsection 5 has been omitted or deleted which means you do not have to go to an independent accountant or a cost accountant to get your GST 9C certified. But at the same time, it puts a lot of onus on the taxpayers to get a reconciliation done between the financials and the GST filings and uh, keep it up for scrutiny. Um, uh, maybe it's like a, it's like it's like double whammy or maybe it can be it's a two sided kind of a thing. Uh, GST or 9C could have taken some bit of risk away from the taxpayer, but Again, self-assessment will put a lot of responsibility or onus on the uh, supplies as well. And uh, you just touched upon on zero rating of supplies. It's only restricted to authorized operations. If you just look at the SCZ Act, any supplies to the SCZ uh, uh, was uh, tax exempt, but uh, now it should be only for authorized operations. There was an anomaly between the SCZ rules and the GST exemptions. They have corrected it, Bala. So these are a few things. Uh, uh, which uh, maybe surrounding around the make in India is of doing business and at least to some cases uh, removal of anomalies. And before I hand over the discussion back to you and one big change from a GST perspective is that uh, the concept of mutuality of interest is gone, which oh. means the many, yeah, so the cooperative societies and specifically the resident welfare association have been taking a position saying that I'm not providing any supply per se, it is for the larger community interest and there were some apex code judgment also that they've specifically changed in the rule set in the gst law which says mutuality of interest is taken away so you do not uh, you cannot uh, have this card uh, to play for not paying gst as well this is my take uh, bala over to you absolutely thank you thank you L lan uh, if i can come back to you uh, you know and shifting gears back to a, a, you know economy and uh, the financial sector uh, you know there's a concept of bad bank right you know the 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 asset reconstruction uh, company and uh, and partly uh, you know i think the reaction from the market is also uh, because of this announcement uh, and of course the public sector banks which have been given some uh, you know 20000 crores of allocation etc uh so what are your thoughts on on this and um, uh, I, i'm sure there's something more to be uh, you know done here and uh, more will be uh, you know the rbi will also chip in in this uh, but intent wise uh, do you think that uh, you know this is going gone in the right direction or going in the right direction um well there are, there are, there are two views on this bala but i think broadly yes uh, there's um the big the 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 conceptual debate with the bad bank was the the choice between cleaning up cl freeing up capital for regular banks to do business versus the risk of moral hazard once you have a precedence of a bad bank the fear was always saying that will there be a tendency to accumulate uh, behaviorally as mm -hmm. a, uh, as a, as uh, researchers call it 
academics call it to behaviorally accumulate some amount of thing because you know there's always a bad bank will that thing so the moral hazard question was always there but the reality was that the the, the banking system was getting clogged we've seen the credit growth rates if you over the last uh, three four years uh, the public sector banks have just not been able to do even in the last one year when economy is taken back we've seen the private banks kind of take lead but the others some are, some have taken some have not so that that whole the need to create and free up space and capital for people to do from that point of view, it's a welcome step but in like in this is one of the three or four very big announcements where we'll have to watch the deal like the one on dfi we'll have to watch the details and watch the way it gets executed and like you said the rbi kind of gets into the act how they make that happen but to see how effective it is intent wise absolutely i think this, this is something that we needed but but land this uh, you know asset reconstruction concept is not new right you know it is there in the private companies uh, the private yes. financial institutions so the the public financial institutions and the public sector banks have to adopt it uh, and uh, so you know in fact i saw one interview of uh, another uh, you know a leading banker a public sector ex banker to say that there could be hesitation uh, you know from the public sector banks to get into this because if the asset really performs well after it is being sold off uh, they may be questioned right yes. so so how how will the hesitancy factor uh, be addressed here and yes. who is going to decide which is which is bad and which is not bad uh, you know based on um, uh, you know hindsight knowledge yes bala and that is that is one of the challenges because for example what is the, including what is the value attitude will transfer to the arc right how many cents to the dollar is acceptable because later right. on it might be that it either turn out to be a brilliant decision or a dud mm -hmm. if they recover the whole money and uh, especially in the public sector these questions are there so uh, in some sense the protection part that's what i meant when i said how will rbi come and give guidelines which will right. allow these people to take those decisions because you are right arc as a concept is not new before there before that they had that 5 uh, uh, 1585 rules and stuff like that where people could do things like that it never took off but that mm -hmm. but the concept of the bad bank was that you will free up because all these bad banks clock capital will free it up operationally how they do that how will they execute it is a matter of detail so yeah we'll have to watch that space uh, as to how it exactly goes through there will be got execution it. challenges on that got it got it uh, uh rukmi majumdar uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know the borrowings of uh, uh, you know the government right you know the in fact uh, finance minister mentioned that between now and march he has to go out to the market and seek 80000 crores so are you going to see uh, you know once the government comes in and uh, crowds out the liquidity uh will, will what will happen to the bond market bond yields and uh, you know and the uh, the interest rates uh, how the rbi is going to balance uh, the the government's intervention and its own uh, role in this right so uh, the rbi has been Your your voice is very feeble, uh, Rukmi. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I my mic. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So it's often uh, there's a very established theory uh, in economics that market takes care of itself. It's the invisible hand of Keynes that was uh, and the Adams which was put forth. Now this works when everything when the economy is in a balance. There's a proper demand and supply equilibrium maintained. however when whenever an economy is in a shock the private market fails to act and the, uh, and if, in over the last uh, few quarters and even before that we might have noticed that private investment has been actually very really low it's been declining for last six quarters straight so in a in a in a at times when the private market is not picking up and the economy is in a vicious circle of low demand low investment that's when you need the government to step in to an extent which which even crane gains proposed that if when you are in a recession and the private market is not able to take off on its own then the government has to spend money uh, through borrowing and even like the, the example that keynes had given is you let people dig money and fill the same road uh, so dig sorry dig the road and uh, uh, fill that same road and give them money 
just to so that at least there is some sort of push to the economy and once it is on a sustainable growth path then the government can uh, take back what you're talking about crowding out the fact that the investment is uh, private investors are not even investing it is contracting for last six quarters that question is, is not there because uh, even without government stepping in that momentum will not come in uh, and hence the government spending is needed unfortunately yes as i mentioned earlier we do not have resources and uh, even though uh, the government has laid out the uh, whole uh, argument of doing uh, asset sa sales or monetizing their assets or privatization but these take time i mean you, but right now government needs money now today over the next one year when the recovery is still nascent and in the government has to step in the best way to do is is borrowing and and get get it started so i would say is uh, let's have a more focus on get the economy rolling once uh, uh, once the economy and 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 one has to look into the uh, the portfolio of the government borrowing as well so if you look at the debt that government holds 95% of it is domestic borrowing very very few low external borrowing as such actually 98% which means our exposure to uh, foreign uh, debt are uh, and many uh, and which is is very low so in instability because of high external borrowing issue is not there as of now going forward whenever government sees that the economy is on a sustainable path and if there is a possibility of reducing the debt the government will start consolidating and that what government has nicely uh, mentioned that that if you notice the fiscal deficit is nine and a half percent this year 6.8 percent next year but four four and a half percent by 24 25. so very clearly the government has sent out message that we will consolidate when needed but not now is not the time got it and borrowing is a quick quick way of getting funds absolutely absolutely thank you uh shaker uh you know while you talked about uh you know the faceless uh, assessments and faceless appeals etc uh, you know i see this reassessment uh, procedure which has been replaced right you know a new procedure has been brought in uh the search provisions are also you know kind of ducktailed into this reassessment procedure because the assessments which are hitherto made under 153 etc for uh, uh the the search and the seizure will also come into the re, the 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 new provisions of 147 to 150 you know three etc right but you know intent wise she wanted to reduce the time period right she said that she's going to reduce it to three uh, but actually what you see is, you know, the six years limitation that we had has got an extended to 10 years, right? So, and for a very, you know, uh, pitly sum of 50 lakhs, if, if there is a escapement of a assessment of just 50 lakhs, uh, you know, the assessment can be kept open for 10 years and there is no, uh, you know, higher uh, threshold of, you know, fraud or misrepresentation, uh, etc., which were all there in the erstwhile 147 provisions, even where there is true, uh, you know, uh, and true and correct uh, uh, submission of the material facts, uh, uh, the reassessment cannot be opened beyond four years. Those were protections which were available, you know, in the, in the existing regime. Those are not there in the new ones. So, you know, is there a is there a gap between the intent and the and the, and the fine print which has come on the reassessment procedure? Shaker, you're muted. So, if you look at the provisions, Bala, the entire reassessment provisions are brought down to three years. And what she made in the speech yesterday is that only in the case of a tax evasion, I I, I reproduce a phrase Serious tax fraud. evasion. It's Serious tax fraud. evasion and serious frauds, if that has happened and if the tax impact is more than 50 lakhs, then the reassessment will happen within a period of 10 years. However, it is subject to the approval of the principal chief commissioner of income tax, which is highest officer in the respective jurisdiction. Now, if you go to the sections, the section says more than uh, up to 10 years for 50 lakhs is get two cases. Number one is serious tax evasion has happened and also where the assessments has not been completed in accordance with the provisions of the act and it was founded by the Comptroller and Auditor General of India. So let's take two scenarios. Scenario number one where I have furnished all the information a mere omission by the AO. Will it create a reassessment? Number one. 
there is no fraud there is no evasion there is no tax evasion there is no search and seizure but i have given all the information but there is a mere omission by the officer to look at it can it come under the reassessment of bracket of 10 years my answer is no because very clear there are two important reasons the finance minister's speech in the house of parliament is always considered as an interpretation for the interpreting the law basis by the supreme court judgment in multiple plethora of cases now a mere omission by the officer to not to consider the information cannot come as a part under the term of serious fraud or a tax evasion there are much bigger words second if you look at the scheme of the provisions what was introduced yesterday probably again as a part of bcac we need to make a representation to the government to clear the doubts is that wherever there is a search and seizure has taken place wherever the books of accounts are not maintained properly wherever there is a case of a fraud then the 60 to more than 6 years and up to 10 years the issue will come up and it has to be approved by the principal chief commissioner of income tax so therefore my way i looked at the provision is that a mere omission by the officer or a mere remark by the cndg on the omission of the officer it cannot compel for a case of bringing under the tax evasion or a serious fraud second important aspect from a chamber perspective we need to make a representation to the government that this sort of six more than six years and up to 10 years should get warranted only under the serious circumstances and also to raise the limit of 50 lakh to higher limit so that the small tax payers are a omission cannot be a basis for the reassessment that sort of a representation we should make it from bcsc bala ओटी बल बैक्टी बल या thank you thank you shekhar i think we we'll have we have uh, uh, you know a lot of things to uh, take away from that i think we need to make uh, representations uh, on on this aspect uh, baskar moving on to you you know you mentioned about uh, briefly mentioned about uh, the the scz uh, uh, the zero rating and the uh, authorized operations uh, another thing is uh, the the itc the input tax credit right uh now that is getting restricted to what is uh, what is going to be reflected in your purchase register uh yeah. there were uh, certain limitations which were put probably those limitations were uh, uh to your advantage previously because even if uh, uh, you know your uh, vendors don't update uh, then up to certain percentage you were allowed to take now you are you are purely at the mercy of your vendor right uh, yeah. how, how do you take this forward no i think uh, bala you said it right earlier uh, there was a position in terms of saying that it was a vested right if i have paid taxes to the vendor why can't i claim it and there are plethora of cases in the judicial forums and uh, now the government has said that they've amended section 16 to say that until it's reflecting in the um, the output side of the vendor and it is reflecting in your 2a versus 3b kind of a thing you cannot go and claim the credit and uh, they have just reinforced this provision and not only this uh, bala is slightly digressing the government is just going to deal uh, uh, with the iron fist in terms of if at all you are taking the credit without that getting reflected in your uh, uh, input tax credit ledger uh, if somebody is just claiming an export incentive in terms of rot tap or any other schemes and if it turns out to be a fake one they are going to just confiscate the goods they are going to just slap a penalty they are going to slap an interest so one has to keep in mind that this government is going to deal with these kind of non compliances with an iron fist so keeping this in context uh, i would be rather be conservative in terms of you no know, uh, prepping up uh, for this kind of uh, uh, tax future or indirect tax scrutiny so that to avoid any unpleasant experience with the uh, india government and more importantly as i always keep saying that the government knows more about you as compared to you know about yourself yeah because of the ai and uh, machine learning and things like that so we need to be very very careful and make sure that even inadvertently people don't make mistakes and and what about uh, the uh, the rule which says that uh, the, you know the the goods and services which are entitled to zero rating would be notified 
is there is there a move towards uh, restricting the items and uh, so that you know we, we will have some impact uh, in terms of what we are entitled to uh, as an exemption yeah again it's like from a rebate mechanism uh, again bala there was a number of cases where the eous and the stpas could not claim a refund of uh, uh, taxes upon payment of gst on their export of products 9610 and there were a number of cases again uh, it's like reinforcing by just by putting in the legal provision so that it is beyond challenge yeah the notifications i have to read the fine print but uh, it's more from a from a Status holder of the exporter is what I would believe. Uh, okay, so it's it's it. not restricted to SCZ. It'll it'll also come into STPI and EVU, and yeah. it may open up uh, the ability for these units to take advantage. Is, is yeah. that is and that how it is? Yeah, and uh, if somebody does not have a domestic tax liability, maybe one instance is they may not be in a position to recover the tax credit attributable to capital goods. And that's one of the pain points for the industry. Inputs and input services, of course, you get a refund, but uh, in the capital goods, there is a challenge. Got it, got it. So I think, you know, I have come to the end of my, uh, you know, panel discussion. I don't see any questions from the participants, uh, you know, at this point in time. If you have any questions, please post it on the chat box. We'll have We'll have time to take two, three questions. I'll I'll go back to each panelist and take their closing remarks. Uh, land thirty seconds. Any closing remarks from you? And then we'll come back to the participants' questions if the, if there are any. Right. Um, so I think at, at the I, I think this is going to be one of those things where uh, you know the uh, yeah as they say we have going back to my cricket analogy we've seen of the new ball. We we'll love to see how the rest of the session uh, ha happens. Whether the bat will sort of continue to do well, the team will continue to do well. So therefore, we'll all focus on execution of that. How these things go through. Many of the issues that have come up in today's from on different aspects need clarification. Uh, we we'll have to wait and watch. But I think uh, as the adage goes, well begun is half done. And from that stage, I think we have got off on a good start. Wonderful. Thanks, Lan. Uh, Rukmi, uh, do you have you know? your closing remarks um so um uh, a second can you hear me yes we are able to hear you okay so um i would say is the budget is very nice been very honest and uh, it has given a forward guidance of where it wants to uh, how much is willing to do and support the economy and that's something which uh, will give investors confidence uh, india is attracting foreign investors and this is a good time to give them the assurance that yes we are willing to do what it takes so i think it's a it's a very good uh, uh, message that to give on shekhar in addition to your closing remarks can you address the uh, advance sure bala bala are you there hello Hello. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah, Bala. Yeah, Bala, are you able to hear me? Shakti and Sunil. I think he might have got logged out, but okay, fine. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the question. Yeah. One of the questions on the advance ruling changes. How do you you know see the changes that have been uh, brought into the advance ruling? You sure, know, Sunil. I will answer that question, Sunil. Uh, let me give two perspectives. Number one, on the changes in the advanced ruling, in my view, uh, the same finance minister made us two statements that we are looking for a ruling uh, authority to independent for a dispute resolution panel for the small taxpayers. Number one. Number two, uh, if you look at the advanced ruling, we need to wait for how the advanced ruling is going to get revamped and the practicals and details of the uh, revamping of the advanced ruling. But certainly, the advance ruling needs to be revamped because there's a quite a lot of logging of cases, a backlog of cases. The entire advance ruling needs to be disposed of within six months. But today, we have the advance ruling application which is still pending for five years. But I have filed application in 2012, still has not been heard. And one of the challenges of advance ruling is the appointment of members and availability of members. So any revamping for the advance ruling should be because we, we have seen the worst of the advance filling. I think any revamping should be done on the better side. And I am looking for a more positive side of the advance filling. 
And third aspect of the advanced learning, the revamping, which definitely from a chamber perspective as a professional, I'm looking forward is the introduction of a private rulings for the taxpayers for a certain amount of transactions. Today, it is applicable for a non-residents and the residents, public sector companies and the residents more than certain value of certain transactions. So if advanced ruling gets revamped, which will minimize the arising of disputes, we always talks about a, a resolution of disputes, but I look at any prevention of disputes and if advanced ruling gets revamped in a manner to lead the prevention of disputes, that would be great. So I, I am looking at a more positive side of the advanced ruling. We need to wait for the details, but I am looking forward. So my closing comments, as Bala was talking about the budget, uh, in my view, made a honest attempt. She has the government has made sincere efforts, put down uh, the priorities in the areas where it is required most. Implementation is the key. But as I said in my opening remark, this government has done certain phenomenal uh, steps in implementation of certain key, particularly uh, like some of the areas like Jandan Bank or Ujwala scheme and all the government has done. A lot of uh, government should be given credit for implementing certain key schemes. I'm sure this government will take care of it and implement it. And more than that, I am seeing a lot more change in the uh, positive side is that the government is making serious efforts to address the tax administration. And if it gets addressed in two to three years, but for some minor issues like what Sunil talked about, reversing the Supreme Court ruling on goodwill, though I have my own views on the Supreme Court ruling, but removing the goodwill depreciation and TDS on the buying and sale of goods, all those things can be awarded. But having said that, I see a more intent, a positive intent, and look forward to a better implementation. That's all my, my closing comment, Bala. Sunil, you are still there? Yes, hi Sunil. Sunil, your your uh, closing remarks. Yeah, so I think um, all in all, like I said, it's been a, it's a very good uh, budget under the circumstances. Uh, good to see that um, it is, you know, looking forward from a at least short to medium term. Um, a roadmap in terms of where the fiscal deficit is going to be the next, uh, you know, three years or so. Um, a higher capital expenditure, which is a welcome move. The only uh, concern is obviously going to be in terms of uh, how this would impact, uh, impact inflation. Uh, so I guess that is one thing that uh, the government would need to watch out for. But um, hopefully, you know, execution, if it is done well, then I think uh, you know we'll come out uh, on the other side uh, being better than where we are. Wonderful, Baskar. I think we have to do a lot of uh, reading on the uh, notifications <laughs> still, right? Uh, you know, uh, but uh, what are your uh, yeah thirty Bala, second uh, yeah, thirty second thing is uh, everything is uh, getting orchestrated to a China plus one kind of a supply chain. The finance minister herself did mention that we wanted to be part of the global value chain and looking at all these things. So it's more from a make in India, rationalization of custom duty, easing of doing uh, business in India, and more importantly to augment the tax uh, collections, uh, dealing uh, uh, defaulters with the iron fist. Uh, that's all uh, overall uh, comment from me, Bala. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think uh, uh, it's been a it's been a wonderful uh, panel discussion here, and uh, I, I really enjoyed talking to all of you. And uh, thanks uh, to the Bangalore Chamber for the opportunity. Uh, looking forward to inputs from the members, uh, you know, on on any of the proposals that we need to take back to the government. Uh, we will we will, uh, you know, make honest uh, effort on the representation. Like Shekhar mentioned, this time we had uh, a one on one interaction with the finance minister, and uh, uh, our recommendations were really taken, uh, uh, you know, to the to the fine print of the budget. Uh, so if, if there are concerns still on any of the direct tax proposals uh, or the indirect tax, uh, please free, feel free to uh, you know send that to the committee and we will take it uh, uh, you know to the government at an appropriate uh, time. Thank you so much and uh, Bala, over Bala, to you, is, Prithvi. Yes. Yeah, Bala, uh, one question we, from Dr. Krasta. Yes, uh, 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 Krasta has to put the questions in the box. Please raise the, uh, we don't have the time to answer the question. Let him put a box, we'll answer it. 
sorry, Kastav, we are running short of time. If you can put the questions in the box, I'll request Baskar to answer it. Tapti, over to you for summing up, Tapti. Uh, yeah, we don't have too much time for a complete summary, but uh, I'll just uh, reiterate what Bala mentioned. So the events for the budget uh, started off much before 1st of Feb, and uh, with uh, the technical and sector insights that have been uh, provided to the FM, BCIC has is really on a different kind of a stage today in terms of eminence uh, with the detailed representation that has been made. And what is what really makes us proud is the teaming and collaboration that's, uh, that we've uh, been able to achieve involving all of the panelists, uh, all of the members, in fact, um, and to create this platform uh, to take it. So thank you uh, to Mr. Parashuram and Shekhar for steering BCIC and hope to uh, for greater things to come. Um, as far as uh, you know, a quick uh, summary, uh, we did hear from um, uh, uh, Mr. Kamal with regard to uh, you know, the lives, livelihood, and creating uh, sustainable goals uh, within uh, uh, you know, the different sections of the society, be it in terms of uh, equity in society, building the brand, India, uh, monetizing public uh, property, defense, inclusive growth, automation, AI, and, uh, and so forth. He's also called out uh, challenges in terms of uh, deficit uh, financing um, and which could lead to inflation how can that be curtailed execution from a district administration onwards uh, how do we pool resources because all of us are stakeholders in it uh, disinvestment targets is another concern uh, how do we get uh, the industry and manufacturing to upskill our people how do we uh, you know the restructuring of customs duty by 2021 uh, uh, to uh, not have any issues on the inverted uh, duty structure, GST rationalization. Mr. Lakshmi uh, Narayan also called out, what you see is what you get. Uh, and that itself, no shocks and all, and that itself was positive. <laughs> he called the uh, budget an accountant's budget, uh, but uh, called out different uh, perspectives uh, and areas where the, uh, where, uh, the FM has been conservative talks about economic survey being the precursor <laughs> and other several um, challenges as well. So I'll now uh, hand it over to Murli for uh, the closing remarks and the vote of thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I, as Secretary of uh, British Industries Association, uh, express my profound thanks to the office bearers of BCIC and BIA for co-hosting this important topic on analyzing the union budget uh dissecting the same threadmare for understanding of all of us uh, my thanks specifically goes to mr tr parsaraman president uh, mr kr shaker senior vice president mr kamal bali president and managing director of World group india and mr lakshmi narayan chief endowment officer azim premji foundation uh, the panel discussions with industry and the tax experts moderated by mr k balasubramaniam uh, chairman direct tax expert committee bcac and vp and uh, global head uh, corporate head corporate tax vipro has been knowledge enriching my Thanks goes to all the panelists, uh, Mr. Kamal Bali, Mr. Lakshman Narayan, Mr. K. Shekhar, Mr. Rukmi Majumdar, Mr. Dr. Uh, sorry, Rukmi Majumdar, Mr. Sunil Kumar Dareshwar, and Mr. Baskar. Our thanks to uh, Ms. Tapte Ghosh for nicely summing it up. Uh, uh, we all know that execution and accountability is there, is the key, and uh, intent is there. So, I, in addition, I, I thank each and every participant for doing the webinar for spending their time. The second of the issues, like by Ms. Prithvi and his team, has done a laudable job in coordinating with all the stakeholders. Uh, thanks, one and all. Uh, wishing you a very great day ahead. Thank you very much. Over to you, Prithvi. Well, oh, thanks. Uh, thanks for all of your time and also like to thank the participants for uh, being patient hearing and uh, had a good uh, the post budget analysis done uh, by the uh, panelists and the speakers. We like to thank all the uh, participants. Prithi, I have a small request. Prithi, please, a small request. I re uh, please send an email to all the members asking their inputs. We are collating responses from all the members to make a representation to the post budget. So I request every member and also you circulate all the members to give their views so that we can call it and send it across. Sure, sir. We'll do this. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thanks, Bala. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.